I can... This is not on. If I can have your attention, please, we'll, we'll begin the program. So if you could all take your seats. I know there's a security line downstairs, so people will continue to be coming in as we speak, but we need to, uh, we need to begin. So if those in the back can take a seat, that would be great. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Steve Orleans, President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. For the, last 30, for the last 40 years, the committee has been at the forefront of exchanges between the United States and China and the education of each country about each other. We are thrilled today to be partnering with the China Center for Economic Research to bring you this outstanding group of economists from China. A little over 30 years ago, when I first moved to Beijing, reform and opening had just begun and outcomes were not clear. My friends and I in Beijing used to talk about Chinese economic planning the way some people used to talk about the first polar flights. If you remember in the 70s, we had just begun polar flights and instrumentation was questionable when they went over the poles. So we used to joke the pilot, after about seven hours of flight, comes on the intercom and he says, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. The good news is we're ahead of schedule. The bad news is we're lost. <laughs> well, we know that's no longer the case for China's economic planning, and its success in its economy has changed the face of China and changed the face of the world. We could not have asked for better timing for today's program. But let me assure you that we had nothing to do with the story in the New York Times on January 1 calling into question China's economic policy. But I'm confident that Dr. Lin and Chairman Chin and others will have some words to say about Dr. Krugman's essay in the Times of that day. Decisions in Beijing affect virtually every stock price traded six floors below us here. It is fitting that we can host today's event in the New York Stock Exchange. Today, 80 companies from Greater China are traded here with a market capitalization as of this morning in excess of 1.1 trillion US dollars. These listings are a great symbol of how intertwined the US and Chinese economies have become. We've been working with the New York Stock Exchange and partnering with the New York Stock Exchange for a number of years now, and they are a terrific partner. In fact, it was a little more than a year ago, as you see in the photos downstairs by the entrance, that the National Committee was honored by the New York Stock Exchange as we rang the opening bell commemorating the one-year anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and China. We are privileged this morning to have with us the CEO of NYSE Euronext, Duncan Niederauer. He has been honored by the National Committee last year for working to promote constructive US-China relations and has been a great friend to the committee over these last years. Before Going on to the program, let me call on Duncan to give a few words of welcome to all of you. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. It is indeed our honor and privilege to 
uh, to be hosting this event this morning. I always like to see this room sold out like this. It's fantastic, Steve. Thank you for that nice introduction. So uh, thank you for letting us host you, uh, the committee, and CCER today. Um, we find ourselves in January of 2010, I think, in a much, much better place than we did a year ago. If we had been having this meeting in January of 2009, I think we it would have been one where we were asking ourselves many different questions than I think you're going to be asking yourself over today's session and the sessions you'll be having uh, tomorrow and into Saturday. And I think that uh, the good news is the markets rewarded us in 2009 by stabilizing. So they've recovered. They seem to have recovered. Now it's time to shift our focus to what does a more sustainable global economic recovery mean? From our point of view, as we prepare to go meet with world leaders and other officials in Davos at the end of this month, the message we're going to be delivering is that it's terrific that the markets have regained credibility. Now it's time for the world's econom economics, uh, I'm sorry, the world's economies to show that they too can restore credibility and confidence. And from our point of view, um, to restore the confidence that the, we need the average consumer to have is going to require and necessitate a number of issues. Uh, one of them is it's going to be absolutely necessary that we see credit flowing uh, throughout the system again, particularly to small businesses. We continue to urge the world's governments and particularly our administration here to insist, not just encourage, that the banks lend to small businesses. I think it's important that we remember that we live in a globalized world. We must defend that globalization, and we must resist protectionism, and we must fight it wherever we see it. Um, we've gotten this far encouraging innovation, encouraging sensible risk-taking, encouraging entrepreneurship, and I hope that we don't use the crisis as an excuse to stop doing those things. I also think there's going to be a need for what I would call real financial regulatory reform. I get asked quite frequently, we're 15 months after what we would say was the beginning of the crisis, you know, can we point to a lot of reforms in the financial markets that have been put in place to reduce the likelihood of a similar crisis? And I'm sad to report the answer is really there's not much to point to. Uh, in point of fact, very little has changed since September of 2008. Uh, we think there's a lot of talk, uh, there's a lot of directionally correct statements in point of fact, nothing substantive, nothing substantive has really been put in place. So I think our collective challenge for 2010 is to, th is to see some regulation that is focused on transparency rather than opacity, uh, clearing of OTC derivatives, going at the root of where the problem was around systemic risk management and trying to solve some of those issues going forward. As Steve said, we have a long and, and mutually productive relationship with China, and it's one that I'm, I'm proud to continue as I steward this organization. Uh, w there is no doubt, and why you're all gathered here today to talk about the next couple of days, the world's eyes are going to be on China to see how it deals with I its own economy and what role it's going to play in the world's economic recovery. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, investors, not just in Asia, but in U.S. and Europe for sure, are watching every move China makes now. Uh, no one's confused about the role China will play and the relevance it will have going forward. And it's quite obvious to us that for China to achieve its ambitions, its companies will continue to access not only their local capital markets, but their ca the capital markets around the world. Uh, Steve mentioned that we're proud to have 80 companies listed with us now. Their market cap is in excess of $1.1 trillion. But what I'm happiest about is four or five years ago, the composition and the demographics of the companies we had listed here were all the biggest of the big SOEs. And while we still have a number of SOEs listed here, you know, the 27 companies that joined the ranks of the NYSE community last year, uh, 17 of them were on our NYSE Amex platform, which was for small and medium-sized enterprises. So my view is as long as I'm in charge, we're going to put our money where our mouth is, and it isn't about just facilitating large companies that want to access the capital markets, but it is being consistent with what I said about getting those small and medium-sized companies access to capital. We believe we can play a critically important role in that, and you can count on us to continue doing that. Um, as I've mentioned before, 
We also intend and are hopeful to be the first U.S. company to list its shares on the Shanghai Stock Exchange, which we hope will happen in 2010. Still a lot of work to be done there, a lot of details to be worked out, but I think part of China's ongoing reform of its own financial markets will be to open up and to internationalize the Shanghai market, and we look forward to being a customer of the Shanghai Stock Exchange soon to continue our partnership there. So before I turn it back to Steve, I just want to say we are proud to have been a partner of China, and we will continue to be a good partner. Uh, we're equally proud to be a, a sponsor of the World Expo uh, in Shanghai in May, when I will next be in China for some other meetings there. And we are also proud to be the provider of the venue for your meeting this morning. Please have a wonderfully productive session. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Um, in addition to thanking the New York Stock Exchange, uh, I want to thank the Peking University Alumni Association for helping us to organize this event. And I also want to thank the Star Foundation, who funds um, events like this for the National Committee. Without philanthropy like this in the United States, we would not be able to hold an event like this. Finally, let me thank our partners, the China Center for Economic Research, which is a part of China's renowned Peking University's National School of Development. The distinguished group of economists that we have before us is a tribute to their reputation in ep and efforts. Let me turn it over now to the executive director of the China Center for Economic Research, Professor Wu He Mao. With a PhD in economics from that wonderful school in the, on the West Coast, Stanford, Professor Wu is one of China's leading authorities on China's financial markets, so our venue today is particularly appropriate. Professor Wu. Good morning, everyone. It's our honor to come here to present our forecast and view on China's economy in 2010. On behalf of the China Center for Economic Research, I would like to welcome all and each of you. You may wonder, what is CCER? In the future, you can update your information from the website of CCER. I can briefly say that here today, that CCER is a unique institute in China. It was established 15 years ago by scholars returning from overseas to China. Besides the usual function of teaching and research, CCR also aims to be a think tank for economic policy in China. In year 2008, when China celebrated its 30th anniversary of economic reform, there was a poll for either the most influential person, the most important institute, or local government for the success of China's reform. CCR was elected as the only academic institute that had major impact on the path of China's reform. As one example, the founding director of CCR was later selected to become the chief economist and senior vice president of World Bank. You can guess, that's uh, Dr. Justin Lin, who is also speaking today. As uh, another example, the founding <coughs> deputy director, Dr. Yi Gang, later became the deputy governor of People's Bank of China, who is managing a large sum of foreign exchange reserve now. In year 2008, on the basis of CCR's achievement, we established the National School of Development at Peking University. Our goal is to promote the use of rigorous and the interdisciplinary method to study the development problem in China. It is also our goal to promote the understanding of Chinese economy not only by 
uh, uh, Chinese people, but also by the international community. So that's a background for us to hold this conference today. So we'd like to take this opportunity to thank the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations for making this conference possible. For our team from China this time, our leader and the most senior person is Dr. Qin Xiao, the chairman of China Merchants Group, who is also going to speak later. For all the members of our team, will be introduced sequentially later. So for today's conference, I hope that we can all benefit from enhanced mutual understanding of each other for the benefit of both U.S. and China. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Wu. I should also recognize that we have our chair with us today, Ambassador Carla Hills, and her husband, Rod Hills. Uh, Rod, as many of you know, used to be chairman of the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, so it's very appropriate that he be in this building. And given that he's here, I should also um, make sure that I fully disclose. So I should say that in um, 1986, the committee gave a promising um, PhD student from the University of Chicago uh, a job translating for one of the first, or maybe the first group of Chinese economists that um, came to the United States. And we were very worried because normally these jobs are given to Americans, but in this case we changed and this person seemed so impressive that we gave it to this Chinese national. And by all accounts, Justin Lin did a spectacular job. <laughs> so we have not been surprised that at his career in the subsequent, we at the National Committee have not been surprised at his career in the subsequent 23 years and are not at all surprised that he got the well-deserved promotion to become the first chief economist of the World Bank from a developing country. You have his bio, so I'm not going to go over his many accomplishments, but just say that we are privileged today to have him here and privileged at the National Committee to have him as a friend. Justin Lin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a truly pleasure for me to speak in today's forum, organized by the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and the China Center for Economic Research, also at New York Stock Exchange. As Stephen just mentioned, I was the founding director of China Center for Economic Research. But my first job that I got after I graduated from the University of Chicago was the interpreter to accompany a group of Chinese delegates to come to visit the U.S. to learn how to do the market-oriented reform. And uh, that delegation made one stop at New York Stock Exchange. I also like to take this occasion to congratulate the U.S.-China relations, US, uh, the National Committee on U.S.-China relations, its contribution to the improvement of friendship between U.S. and China. Also, its contribution to the success of China's market reform. If you know the member of the delegation of the group I accompanied, you will know how large the contribution that visit made to China. Among the members, including Ma Dan Wu Xiaolin, he was the former, former deputy governor of Central Bank in charge of China's reserve. Also included was Zhou Xiaochuan, currently the governor of China's central banks. And uh, certainly now we are in the 
21st century, and we are entering into the second decade of the 21st century. U.S.-China relation is increasingly important. I'm sure the U.S.-China relation will be in a new chapters. So I'm delighted. My old institution, China Center for Economic Research, has this opportunity to co-sponsor this forum and also the dialogue after this forum. And uh, my first job after the, my GAD degree was an uh, interpreter. It seems to me that ever since then, I have been an interpreter, always. In a trip, I tried to interpret what happened in the US to my Chinese colleagues. And after that, my often job is to interpret what I observed in China to people outside China. And currently, I think the most important phenomena in the global economy certainly is on the one hand, the success of China's reform in the past 30 years. And on the other hand, is the imbalance between China and US and also its contribution to the global imbalance. And so I'd like to use this occasion to give my interpretation about how come China can be so, so successful in its reform. But at the same time, how come there's such an imbalance in China? Well, regarding the success of China's reform, I think everyone here knows. China maintained 9.8% growth rate continuously for 30 years. And that was something no one ever expected. And how that was possible, especially compared to other countries on the process of transition. Most of them, they encountered some kind of collapse in their economy. But China continued to maintain the stability as well as a very dynamic growth. I think the main reason is because of the approach that China adopted. You know that China adopted a gradual approach and also a dual track approach during this reform process. And how come it's so important, this gradual and dual track approach for the success of China's economic development in the past 30 years? It was because before the reform, you know that China adopted strategies to promote the growth of heavy industries, commanding height. And those kind of capital intensive industries was against China's competitive advantages. And in an open market economy, those kind of industries cannot survive. So to establish those kind of industries, the Chinese government, like other socialist planning economy, introduced all kind of distortion to protect those industries, to subsidize those kind of industries. Certainly with that, it was possible to build up the heavy industries, but the economic efficient was very low. And it's a similar situation in China, as well as in other socialist countries. And the final reform started in 1979. Certainly, the common recommendation was to remove all those distortions immediately. But if China did that, those old heavy industry would collapse immediately. And unemployment will rise. Certainly, the economy will encounter the transition collapse. But China is a very pragmatic country. Under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping, it introduced some kind of gradual dual track approach. On the one hand, continue to give some transitional protection to the old industry in order to maintain stability. But on the other hand, liberalize the industry which was replaced in the past, the light, the labor intensive industries. Liberalize those kind of sectors. Allow the private sector to come in and also foreign direct investment to come in into those sectors. Since those sectors are consistent with China's comparative advantages, so China achieved a very dynamic growth during this period. And with the dynamic growth in this labor intensive competitive advantage following sectors, 
it creates a condition to reform the oil sectors. And that is the secret that China achieved stability and a dynamic growth in the past 30 years. But everything has two sides. Although this kind of approach achieved stability and dynamic economic growth, but it also pays some cost. The cost is the imbalance. I think the external imbalance, the trade surplus, receive a lot of attention. But in effect, that is just one component of the imbalance. In addition to that, there's a saving and a investment consumption imbalance. And also income disparity, rural urban disparity and so on. All those are the imbalance during this very rapid economic growth period in China. And how come that such a successful growth path will result in these imbalances? And among those imbalances, I'd like to say, the most important or the key of the imbalances, in effect, is the income disparity. It's the income disparity among the urban, rural, rich, and the poor. Because this income disparity so far in China already reached, measured by the Gini coefficient, about 0.48, as high as in many Latin American countries. And because of this imbalanced income disparity, we know that when you have the income concentrated on the rich people, rich people's their consumption propensity is low, and their saving propensity is high. And the poor people, their consumption propensity is high, saving propensity is low. But if you have the national income concentrated on the rich people, certainly that will depress the consumption, increase the savings, and that causes the saving consumption disparity, imbalance. But when you save a lot, you make a lot of investment. Because of donated consumption, absorption capacity is low, and then you have some kind of excess capacity. And that causes the trade surplus. You need to use the global market to absorb those kind of excess capacity that contribute to the trade imbalance. At the same time, that will cause the regional imbalance and so on. So if we want to address these imbalances, we need to find the reason why in such a rapid economic growth period, this income disparity become larger and larger and causing the other imbalances. The reason the income disparity become larger and larger, it was because of there's many areas of reform which has not been completed. And those kind of reform lag behind is a necessity to protect the old, heavy, large corporation sectors. And I'd like to bring your attention to three key sectors. The first one is in the financial sectors. Currently, China's financial sectors is dominated by big banks, as well as the equity market. We know that only the large corporations have access to the big banks' financial services, as well as the equity market. And uh, big corporations in general, either owned by the state or rich people, and they get the financial services. And the small and medium-sized labor-intensive enterprises, they will not get the whatsoever financial services, especially in the credit. Under that kind of situation, it has two implications to income distribution. The first one is that the labor intensive industry, which can create a lot of jobs, but they are you know, impede in their development because of no financial services. And that reduces job opportunities. And that replaces the wage rate. We know that the low income people, they earn their livings many from their wages. If wage is suppressed, that means their income is reduced. That's one thing. And those kind of low wage become a subsidies to the large corporation. At the same time, this kind of over concentration of the financial sectors also is a mean to reduce the capital cost to the large corporation and uh, or those people who have access to the 
capital services. And that become another subsidy that costs their high profit. That's one thing. And the second thing is that China currently basically would not tax any loyalty on natural resources. Again, that was a legacy. Before the reform, China you know, had a policy to subsidize the heavy industry with low input prices. Natural resources certainly is uh, inputs. And those kind of policy has not been changed yet. But there's something changing in the natural resources sectors. Before 79, all the natural resources enterprises are state owned. But after 79, gradually private sectors joined venture can come into the natural resources sectors. And uh, secondly, after the mid-1980s, the prices of natural resources has been liberalized close to the international prices. But without you know, tax the loyalty on those natural resources, it become an extremely profitable sectors. And only the large corporation and rich people have access to that sectors. And that contribute to the income disparities. And the third one is some monopoly in the financial sector, in the telecommunication and sector, and so on. Certainly, they have monopoly profit. And all those contribute to the income disparities. And with the income disparity, you're going to have saving and investment disparity, saving consumption disparities, as well as the external disparity that we observe. So with this understanding, I think that it's very important for China to complete the transition to a market economy, to remove all those distortions in the financial sectors, in natural resources sectors, and in the monetary sectors. Those kind of reform will allow China to develop more of the sectors which are consistent with China's comparative advantages, create more jobs, increase the income of the common peoples, reduce the income disparities, reduce the saving consumption imbalance as well as the external imbalance. If China can do that, I think China has a hope to continue the dynamic growth in the coming decades. And China can also contribute to the solving of the global imbalance in a year to come. Thank you. Turn this one, yeah, there we go. Um, Professor Lin has agreed to take questions from the audience. C could I kick off with one yeah. question? Which is if the royalties on natural resources are, you know, need, need to be imposed, you know, we've seen, it probably should have been done 20, 25 years ago. We now have CNPC, CNOOC, uh, Sinopec, and others that are publicly listed companies that have large constituencies who will oppose any kind of redistribution of that, uh, of in effect, the, the profits. So do you think it's something that we can expect in the next five years, that we will see kind of an appropriate price for natural resource extraction? Well, I think that is an issue we have been discussing domestically. And uh, there are some kind of emerging consensus for the natural resources sector to be operated efficiently, the right press signals is important. And as you know, the Chinese people are pragmatic. Whatever is good for China is socialist. And so if raising the loyalty is good for China, it's socialist policy. So we can expect that in the coming years. Questions from the audience? Please identify yourself and 
speak I'm loudly. Chang, and um, I, I'm an inv investor in China through a company called Sino Century China Private Equity. Um, thank you for your very elaborate uh, speech. Um, I agree with you that we have to move towards market liberalization in China, but and uh, uh, you had mentioned uh, and the natural resource area is one area. But what about these high tech parks that are existing all over China, which provide tremendous amount of tax subsidies and uh, uh, preferential treatment? Would that that's the first question I have. Would that be is that something that you would? considered to remove so that we can move towards market liberalization. And the second thing is that I believe that China is making every effort to help the, uh, the lesser uh, affluent provinces by helping the farmers become entrepreneurs. What do you think of those uh, reforms and uh, uh, how shall I say, uh, programs that the government has implemented? How successful are they? Uh, the first one, the industrial parks and also tax incentive that attach to industrial parks. I think that's a common practice in all the market economy because economic development is a process of continuous industrial upgrading, technological upgrading. And in this upgrading process, there's a lot of issue economies call externalities and information uncertainty and coordination. And to help with those kind of externality issue, coordination issue, most country, including in the developed country, have some kind of tax incentive to encourage people to go into the new sectors. And in a developing country, because if you want to upgrade your industries, not only you, know, uh, uh, you need to have a tax incentive, you also need to improve the soft infrastructure, high infrastructure. But soft infrastructure, high infrastructure is not easy to improve nationwide and so you can use industrial park in those kind of enclave program to provide those kind of necessary sub infrastructure and high infrastructure and also tax incentive in order to increase that uh, to encourage the, the, the technological upgrading and industrial upgrading. I think that uh, as long as those kind of program is well designed and uh, it will be you know justifiable from economic theory, and it will also make a contribution to the national economic development. Um, right there. Oh, wait for the microphone, please. There's one right next to you. Uh, my name is John Espinoza. I'm a fixed income analyst at uh, TIA Cref here in New York. Uh, in the last year, we've seen um, measures to promote the liberalization of, uh, of the yuan and uh, the liberalization of the, of the capital account. Uh, from a macroeconomic standpoint, uh, what further measures can we see in the coming years on that end? <clears throat> and uh, how do you view the speed of that liberalization on both currency and, and capital account? Thank you. I think that uh, there's two issues. One is the capital account liberalization. The other one is exchange rate management system. And I think that for the capital account liberalization, certainly now there's a lot of study about that. And I increasingly, I think in the academic circle, they now argue for a developing country to have certain extent of control on capital account, it's desirable. And I think there are some kind of you know, increasing consensus on that issue. And for the exchange rate, you know, first, I'm not going to comment on what China's exchange rate policy will be tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. But uh, overall, for a developing country, if it has a rapid improvement in its labor productivities, certainly the exchange rate will you know, uh, uh, appreciate gradually. But the speed of the appreciation certainly need to consider the economic situation domestically and internationally. Let me recognize Nick Lardy, one of America's leading experts on China's economy. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Justin, my question is, uh, in your remarks, you put a great deal of emphasis on the household sector yeah. as the source of China's growing imbalances uh, and emphasize the uh, increasing inequality in the distribution of income. 
But I wonder about that because if you look at it from a timing point of view, at least the official data show that income inequality in China has been rising continuously since the early 80s all the way up to the present. Yeah. Uh, and the major external imbalances did not emerge uh, until the middle part of the last decade, that 2003, 4, 5. So uh, I'm a little um, wondering how the household sector, which has this increasing inequality, all of a sudden would be the source of the imbalances. A lot of the people that have looked at this have placed a great deal more emphasis on the contribution of the government, that government savings has actually increased quite significantly over that period, and that the imbalances originate not so much in the household sector, uh, but in the government sector itself. Uh, and you didn't mention that. I wonder if you think that that might also be a, a factor. Well, I think that if you look into the composition of savings, household savings in China is about 20 percent. And the rest comes from the corporate savings, mainly. The government savings actually is not that large in the rest, because we know the corporate savings is about 20, 25 percent. And uh, certainly, there's some kind of gradual process for those corporate savings to become larger and larger, and especially after the 2004, 2005, become much larger. And uh, this is a phenomenon not only occur in China, but also in other exporting-oriented country, like in Korea, like in Japan also. So I think that certainly that there are some other factors that contribute to the increase in the corporate saving. But the issue is that if you compare China and India, or other countries at the same stage of development, you will find the corporate saving become much larger. And how come the corporate saving become much larger? The large corporation is the main source of the corporate saving in China. And large corporation are either owned by state or by the rich people. And that's the reason why I argue those kind of structure issue contribute to the increase in the large corporate saving in China. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Lin, for the uh, insightful presentation. You mentioned about the key challenges uh, resolving the imbalance uh, in China. How do you see that impact uh, the world economy, and in particular, United States, in resolving that the challenge? Well, U.S.-China imbalance has been, you know, uh, topic for discussion for a long time, and uh, Nick is one of authority on that issue. But there are some facts I'd like to mention, including, you know, you, at the beginning you mentioned the articles by Paul Krugman. I'd like to say that the type of product that China exported to the U.S. are the type of the product that U.S. will never produce anymore, because they are very labor intensive, they are the type of living necessities, and uh, you know, the U.S. has no competitive advantage of producing those type of products. And so the imbalance between the U.S. and China, in effect, reflects some kind of specialization due to the state of development. And uh, if China would not export those kind of labor-intensive type of products, U.S. will have to import from other middle-income or low-income countries. And very likely, the cost of importing from other countries will be higher than the cost to import from China, because the U.S. companies always have a free choice to import from China or from other countries. And currently, they choose to import from China. That means the cost to import from China is lower than the cost to import from other country. So that means that if U.S. Have, has to switch the source of the import from other country, because those kind of products are close to different necessities, that means people are, you know, will have to pay for that no matter how high the prices it is, because that are different necessities. And that means that if China would not import for a certain reason, export those, for a certain reason, those kind of products to U.S., most likely, the trade balance, the trade imbalance in the U.S. may increase. 
And uh, so it will reduce people's different standards because you need to pay higher prices for those kind of different necessities. My name is Victor Jermak. I'm with a company called Rate Financial. We rate the financial reporting of public companies. And my question is, um, you talk about the coming uh, market reforms to a better functioning economy in China. Do you think that's possible without reforms in the social and political infrastructure that makes all civilization growth possible? Yeah. Well, I think that, has, that, that is also an old question has been asked for 30 years. And certainly that uh, in the reform process, the Chinese government need to be accountable. The Chinese government need to improve its efficiency. The Chinese government need to be supported by the Chinese people. And uh, I think that economic development is one of very important dimension that show the Chinese government is accountable. Chinese government is efficient and Chinese government is supported by the Chinese people. Certainly, in the reform process, new tension will arise. For example, I mentioned about the rural-urban disparities and uh, income disparities. And the Chinese government now have a program called the Harmonious Societies. Try to address those kind of disparities. And uh, you know, so as long as the government is accountable, the government efficient, the government is, you know, try to gain the support of the people, I think there's a reason to be confident. This kind of economic progress will continue in China. Let me take a question from the back. I've been <coughs> way in the back there. Did somebody have a, oh, do we have a microphone? Yeah, we've got a microphone in the back. There we are. Yeah. Hello. Uh, uh, Xiaopeng Wu from China's 21st Century Business Herald. Uh, do you see the Chinese housing market a bubble? And uh, if so, will it burst? Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, I've been asked this question last night. And I often say that, uh, you know, economists is not very good, you know, people to make a judgment of those kind of issues. And actually, the economic profession as a whole is not good at making a judgment of those kind of issues. And uh, yesterday I quote you know, one of story I have with uh, Bob Sillers. You know, his, his book, The Irrational Exuberance, was very famous. Everyone said that he predicted the collapse of the dot-com bubble. And when his book was translated into Chinese, and at the book launch, I had the occasion to comment on his book. And I asked him, well, everyone said that you, you know, you, you predict the collapse of the dot-com bubble. In economics, we know if you can predict the collapse of a bubble, you can be billionaire because you can show that, right? And ask him, whether you make money from the collapse of the dot-com bubble? He said he did not. <laughs> and then I asked him that, uh, well, you have so many people teaching finance in the US. Uh, among all this you know, professor in finance is a class. Do they make more money than ordinary investors? And after some thought, he told me, from his judgment, those professors you know, did not make more money than ordinary investors. Well, I, I think that, uh, then I ask them why we should read your book. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my answer to you. I cannot predict. We have time for one last question for uh, Professor Lin, right over here. Thank you, Dr. Lin, for coming. Uh, I have a question. So 10 years, uh, more than 10 years ago, China set up the four asset management company. They took out 1.4 trillion non-performing loans from commercial banks. Yeah. And more than 10 years from, from then, now, uh, the balance of the number for Milan is still 1.4 trillion. So what, what are we going to do with that? Um, more specifically, since the fiscal stimulus plan kicked off last year, yeah. um, 
I think the four commercial banks have been lending aggressively. <coughs> what do you think that will impact the non-performing loan? Thanks. I think that uh, Nick Lardy will be a better person to answer your questions. <laughs> but certainly, I also like to contribute. Yes, the size of non-performing loan may not decline, but as a percentage, it becomes very small now. 10 years ago, 1.4 trillion means about 25 or 40 percent, according to Lardy's, of the total asset of the banking sectors. And now, because Chinese economic size increased so much, 1.4 trillion become, I think, less than 5% of the outstanding loan. So it's very manageable. Thank you. Let's thank Justin Lin for kicking a great kickoff to this. this is great. Thank you so much. Give you this. Well, you have the, the biography of, um, of the chairman of the China Merchants Group, uh, Qin Xiao. So I'm not going to repeat the long list of accomplishments that he has. Um, but let me just say that the China Merchants Bank, under the China Merchants Group, is universally viewed as the outstanding bank in China. And I'm sure it's under your, your, your leadership. The, um, like Justin Lin, Chairman, Chairman Chin also um, worked with the National Committee previously. We have a project called the Preventative Defense Project, where we try to find some of the great minds in China and the United States to come up with ways to avoid conflict. And he is a previous participant in that program. So I think it's fair to say from his participation in that and our observation of that, from his speech last night, from his writings, and from his reputation, we are in for a very interesting talk. But let me turn it over to uh, Chairman Chin. I think I need that. Oh, you need that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, my uh, observations and the perceptions uh, could be uh, based on uh, three words or key words. It's uh, recovery, uh, rebalance, and reform. The, f the first one uh, is uh, a cyclical issue. The second one is a structural issue. And the third one is uh, institutional uh, system issue. Uh, but actually, these uh, three are uh, interrelated because we do not believe these crises are normal bin cycle. Uh, underlying is, uh, is, uh, is a structural one. Uh, so without rebalance, there will be uh, no real recovery. Uh, and uh, when we talk in those uh, rebalance, actually we are talking about the model, uh, growth model for Chinese economy. And uh, on this side, the US one, I think both sides need a reform to change this model. So let's start with the, uh, with the first one uh, talking about the uh, recovery. Uh, from last quarter of uh, 2008 to the uh, last quarter of uh, 2009, China experienced uh, uh, quite strong V-shaped uh, recovery, uh, which is uh, mainly driven by uh, government-led fixed assets investment. Uh, including central one and the local one, the government, and backed up by uh, uh, credit uh, expansion or uh, the money supply. Uh, so it's a good thing, uh, but it paid the cost. Uh, I think the, uh, the program and the policy uh, may a little bit overshooting. Uh, talking about the cost, uh, in the short term, uh, makes the uh, post-crisis uh, uh, period management more complicated. On one side, we still have the uh, deflation uh, pressure because the uh, private sector's uh, consumption and the investment is still weak. Uh, on the other side, uh, we already had some bubbles in the uh, stock market and the housing uh, sector, and uh, there is uh, 
uh, excessive liquidity uh, occurred. So we ha will have some uh, uh, inflation expectations. So it makes uh, the, the macroeconomic policy more uh, difficult to deal with these uh, two uh, uh, coexistence problems. Uh, in the long run, uh, it deteriorated this uh, structural issue. I mean, the uh, overcapacity, uh, particularly for 10 major industries. Uh, they got uh, some government's uh, stimulating uh, plan. Uh, so that's um, my uh, observations and the perception on the uh, re recycle process. Uh, uh, in the year of 2010, uh, we should look at some uh, some economic indicators uh, uh, to really uh, watch the uh, recovery. Uh, let me explain a little bit about the uh, statistic system. Uh, in China, uh, we still use some alternative uh, indicators instead of uh, the world international one. So it's a little bit different. Uh, there are differences between the two systems. Uh, in general, uh, current Chinese statistics uh, overestimated the uh, investment, underestimated the consumption. I will not uh, take time to explain that. But the, uh, the, the, uh, the quarter to quarter growth uh, indicators should be, uh, uh, be uh, attention should be prepared to those, uh, the, these indicators. And the non-governmental sectors, uh, capital expansion and household consumption. And the corporate capacity utilization, inventory, capex, and uh, profitability. Uh, CPI, PPI, and asset price, export and tradable industry recovery. Uh, tradable industry is uh, maybe the latest one to recover uh, because it's, uh, it's foreign trade related. And job growth and urbanization. Some of the indicators is either not available or not disclosed. So you need to build up your own model to, uh, to uh, mm -hmm. find that figure. So that's a real uh, important uh, indicators to show the uh, recovery process. Uh, sorry, I, I missed that. <laughs> it's page eight. Uh, in the in the post uh, crisis uh, period, I think that there's uh, need some uh, policy shifting. Uh, the first one uh, is the uh, is the managing the liquidity. Uh, the uh, the money supply is increased by, uh, I mean, I, M2 is increased by about 30% uh, in the year of 2009. And uh, the, extending, uh, the newly extended loan uh, is amount to uh, 9.7 trillion, uh, which uh, takes up about one third of the total outstanding loans by the end of uh, 2008. Uh, they, unlike in this country, they, those uh, uh, credit uh, start go to the uh, go to those uh, infrastructure. I mean the railway, uh, roadway, and some other infrastructure. So it's uh, it's difficult to uh, recover from the market. So by seeing that, I mean uh, in the next two years, including this year, uh, there you will see the slowing down and the reduction of the money supply and the credit growth. But it will be, be a step by step. Uh, talking about this year, the uh, the planned uh, mm, the target for the uh, credit growth will be uh, 18 percent, uh, which uh, represent uh, which mean uh, uh, about 7.5 trillion. So credit uh, 
uh, the liquidity issue will be a key issue in the next couple of years. Plus, the, the hot money uh, flow uh, and the expectation of the appreciation of RMB. And the, 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 the next uh, focus for the shifting of the, piling, of the policies uh, rebalancing, uh, 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 China do not have balance sheet problem, uh, do not have the big job for the uh, deleveraging, but we do have the big job for de-overcapacity. Uh, there are uh, more than 10 big industries, including steel, uh, non ferrous uh, cement uh, uh, being classified as uh, overcapacity, uh, plus some uh, infrastructure. I mean, the, the toll roads and the, the port. So, as uh, the uh, uh, overcapacity will be the one of the uh, key issues need to be dealt with in the year two, uh, 2010. Uh, the the uh, the 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 uh, uh, excessive capacities on the uh, supply side. On the demanding side, just uh, uh, Professor Lin mentioned that the, 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 there are two uh, key issues. One is the, uh, the disparity between the uh, city and the rural areas as uh, farmers' uh, income, uh, the gap uh, become uh, larger and larger. Uh, the second issue is uh, the, 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 the income distribution is not uh, rational, uh, there are more income being distributed to uh, big companies, uh, state, uh, and less to the labor. Uh, I think for the second issue, uh, it's due to, uh, for a long time, China uh, focused on the heavy industry, uh, particularly for the local government, the, uh, the major, major driven is uh, GDP growth and the tax uh, revenue, uh, the employment, uh, not employment. So they, they, they showed the, uh, the policy, industrial policy showed the shift from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the heavy industry to some uh, service sectors which may provide more uh, employment and uh, we, uh, better uh, income for the laborers. Um, uh, for rural areas, uh, I think it's, uh, the government did a lot of things to try to improve their income. Uh, one of the issues need to be uh, considered is the land. Uh, currently, because of the urbanization, a lot of land being acquired from uh, uh, countryside, uh, which is not uh, under the uh, marketing price. Uh, it's this kind of uh, uh, subsidized. Then uh, this land being used uh, for the uh, development, for the housing and uh, uh, some in the industries. Uh, so th uh, they, they need to uh, shift in some profit or uh, the better of, part of the better of to the, uh, for the transfer payment back to the uh, farmers, which will uh, significantly improve uh, farmers' income. So land is, uh, is uh, quite important issues. Currently, it's not a marketing transaction. And for the, uh, uh, the labor issues, labor income, another issue is the, uh, the, 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 the labor only rely on the uh, wages. They do not have uh, access uh, income. Uh, they, they cannot share those uh, big SOE, uh, state-owned enterprises, profit. I, I, I will talk about that later. 
uh, we should uh, transfer this uh, assets or price or, or, or wealth to the ordinary people instead of being controlled by uh, by government. Uh, the last one is reform. Uh, in the last 20 years, uh, we see uh, integration of global economy uh, and with the process of uh, urbanization and uh, industrialization, China was on the uh, fast track, uh, experienced very high growth uh, uh, rate. But on the same time, there is uh, no significant uh, progress being made for reform. The reason one is uh, there's no pressure for reform. Uh, got, uh, it's uh, easy to, uh, to uh, too easy to, uh, to reform. Nobody wants to reform without pressure and crisis. Uh, now there is a crisis, so it's a good time for us uh, to restart the uh, reform agenda. The second issue is uh, there's no consensus. Uh, there is uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, people believe this crisis shows, or the 20, past 20 years shows, the Chinese model is the best model in the world. Uh, I, I don't agree with that. Actually, I don't think there is a real Chinese model. Uh, for different countries, for different stages of development, there are, have different uh, uh, characteristics or features. But in general, there is only one model for, uh, for market-oriented reform. Uh, so we need a crisis to, to create, uh, to restart the reform agenda, and uh, we also need some uh, consensus. I think the uh, reform, uh, there are several items or issues uh, we have the priority for the reform agenda. First is to transform the uh, function of government. Second is to deregulate the price of the production factors, including uh, uh, land, labor, energy, and the capital, I mean the currency. Third one is the reform SOE. Uh, the last one is the political uh, system. Uh, So-called Chinese model uh, believe uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the model of China is uh, developmentalism government, uh, which uh, uh, involved in the marketing activities and uh, owns a huge uh, amount of uh, uh, economic assets. Mm. Uh, but on the other side, we will see the problems of this, uh, this model, uh, which uh, could be represented as uh, follows, uh, run seeking and the corruption. Uh, then the loss of efficiency and the, uh, the, 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 the profitability due to their bureaucracy or, or transaction cost very high. Uh, rule of fair competition undermined by government's uh, direct resource control and the market participation and the weakening ability of providing, providing public goods. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the role of government in China should uh, uh, transform from uh, a government-led economy to a market-led oriented economy. Uh, from a government focusing on economic development to a government uh, dedicating to uh, uh, providing public good. Uh, Uh, factor prices, including land, energy, and capital, and the natural resources, some public utilities, uh, uh, 
capital, among others, capital is, 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 uh, is one thing. Uh, we could divide, we could separate the capital and other factors. Uh, I, I, I think for other factors, uh, it, it should uh, uh, gradually uh, uh, liberate the price uh, to, to the market price. Uh, otherwise, we'll distort the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the allocation of resources. And uh, they, 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 they made some contributions for the uh, imbalance and uh, surplus, trade surplus. So I believe we need to conduct reform for those uh, prices, uh, energy in particular. Uh, for capital uh, uh, account, I think the more, most important thing is not the exchange rate. It's the mechanism of exchange, currency exchange. Uh, in the year 2005, we made some reform. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, they've, been, they've been described as a BBC, it's a, a band, basket, and a coin. Uh, uh, but actually, there is uh, uh, no, no big changes for band. I mean, the fluctuation is still uh, uh, in the controlled on the managed. Uh, 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 and there's no real basket. Nobody knows the basket. And uh, the curling is, is quite clear. Every is 6% for every year for appreciation which uh, proved to be a failed because nobody knows their destination and uh, which will also encourage the hard money to get into Chinese market because they have uh, certainties for the appreciation of 6%. Uh, uh, during the crisis, uh, it, it, it shifted from a BBC to a packing, the packing again. So it's, uh, it's a quite difficult issue to, uh, quite challenging issue for Chinese. I think we should uh, start uh, 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 a to uh, uh, a we should set up a, a road map and a timetable. I think within five years or 10 years, it could be uh, uh, liberated. Currently under the capital account, there are three major items still uh, regulated as the uh, FDI, uh, foreign debt, and uh, capital market. For the first two, I think it's no big problem to uh, open up it's FDI and foreign debt. For the third one, it's more complicated. It's, uh, it's uh, stock market. Uh, we may start with the, uh, to have more flexible uh, policies for QDII and some other ways. And we, we should have a real uh, 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 ban, in, enlarge the, the, the band to, to, to introduce the marketing uh, factors to uh, let us, let us uh, help us to discover the uh, real exchange rate uh, and have a real basket. Uh, so uh, I think it is uh, one of the issues uh, for, for this year to uh, consider. Uh, that, that, that's uh, uh, factors uh, price. The, the third one is SOE, as I mentioned. Uh, as Adam Smith said, it's, uh, the, the famous book is uh, Wealth of the Nation. Uh, it's not Wealth of the State or Wealth of the Government. Uh, China always proud of the tax and the revenue uh, income of the government. Uh, uh, actually, uh, you should uh, uh, use, use that to, to, uh, to transfer that to the, uh, to the uh, ordinary people. Uh, uh, the, the, the total uh, uh, state-owned enterprise is uh, a huge amount of uh, uh, assets. Probably it's over uh, uh, 10 trillion market cap for those uh, already being listed. Uh, I, I think we should, what we are going to, what we should do to do is to uh, 
transfer this uh, assets uh, either to a so, uh, social net, I mean the pension fund, uh, or through the capital market. Uh, then the government can uh, focus on the, to provide uh, public goods like education, health, pension fund, um, housing for lower uh, income group of people. Uh, last one uh, is the uh, political reform. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, one of the gentlemen here raised the question uh, uh, and uh, have a little bit difference with uh, Professor Lin. I think the key issue is the legitimacy. Uh, currently, Chinese government uh, uh, pin their legitimacy with uh, economic performance. I, I don't think it's the right thing. Uh, if the economic performance is good, there's uh, no motivation for reform. If it got failed, it got a big problem. So we should pin our uh, legitimacy in the modern, modern system. Uh, we need to recognize the, uh, the value system, worldwide value system. Uh, maybe there is a different understanding of this uh, worldwide value system. It starts from the Enlightenment movement uh, in Europe. Uh, there there's must be some Chinese element in it, like what Professor Lin said, the harmonious uh, or, or, or the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the some, uh, some, some Chinese Asian uh, culture. But in general, there will be a, a rational a liberty, a, a individual rights, which, which is basic uh, value, concept of value. Uh, there is a, a quite interesting debate uh, in China. There is a worldwide uh, concept of value, or there is no worldwide concept of value. Uh, I do believe there is a worldwide, but with different characteristics. Second, we need uh, system support. We need a check and balance system uh, to make the government real uh, account accountability, accountable. And the, uh, uh, the, 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 the concept need to have some support from the institution side. Uh, that's that's uh, 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 quite big issues in China. I, I, I think the, 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 the we already had a very good experience for the reform of our economy. Uh, as Professor Lin said, gradually or uh, dual track, I think the same approach may be, could be adopted for political reform. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That is very interesting, a very courageous and ambitious agenda. Um, I have questions, but uh, well, let me ask just one question. Is there any political consensus in China which supports that agenda? No, oh, big debate. Big debate. <laughs> All right, let, let's... Um, Cosmopolitan, there's a cosmopolitan value of concept system or not. They're just always talking about the, uh, the, uh, this, this, so the socialist economy with Chinese characteristics, uh, with Chinese color. I, I think there so, so, must be some basic color. Without basic color, there's, I don't know how to translate that, the <laughs> you, If there's no basic color, what do we mean by different color? When you say different color, Chinese one, India one, that's worse, it's a made comparison with the basic one. There must be basic one. There is, if there's no basic one, I don't know what we mean by Chinese color. Uh, the behind. Sorry. 
Uh, my name is Wendy Lee, a attorney in, in New York. Dr. Ching, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I want to first of all congratulate you for the successful IPO for China Merchants uh, Securities at the end of last year and um, successful New York branch opening for China Merchants Bank in 2008. My question is to follow up your um, presentation topic and the liquidity management of commercial banks. As you know, China Merchants Bank is a leader of the credit card um, business in China. So in addition to the credit card business, um, China Merchants Bank together with other commercial banks has increased its auto loan, car loans, and mortgages, uh, residential mortgages, uh, commercial mortgages um, in the most recent years. When the volume of the credit card receivables, auto receivables, auto loan receivables, uh, residential mortgage and commercial mortgages increases, do you see the possible future for the securitization in China? I know the securitization is a very sensitive topic now in the United States, but of course we don't want the subprime mortgage or we don't want the re-securitization after the bond, um, packaged bond goes into the market. I okay, like okay. To I think he understands the question. <laughs> it's becoming a speech. It okay. is the potential for securitization. Thank you. That's right. Thank you very much. The, uh, the consumer loan, I mean, for the durable goods uh, is still a, a market need to be further explored. Uh, the housing is more well established, I mean, the market for housing, but for car and for some other uh, durable goods is uh, still a, 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 a new market because it contains uh, some risks and you need some other regulations and institutions to support like insurance and uh, other things. <coughs> I think uh, it's a potential market is very big, very huge. Ambassador Speltz. Jin, thank you. I joined Steve in commenting on your courageous statements. Realistically, given the labor problems in the United States, labor problems in China, and uh, the fact that people do not like to change quickly, in your own internal mind, and again, I congratulate you on your thoughts here, and I agree with them, what would you say, 10 years, 20 years, as an objective? in order to move in these directions? <laughs> Talking about the forecasting and uh, observation and the perceptions, uh, there are uh, quite diversified opinions, in positive, negative, op optimistic, uh, pessimistic. On the other, another point is, uh, the methodology are different. Uh, you can divide, if you look at those, uh, those opinions, actually you must be very careful who are they. Uh, first category is, uh, is uh, government, Chinese government. They made some uh, review on their policies, on the process they experienced. Uh, they, aware, sometimes they're aware they made a mistake. They were correct when they, they found they, they made a mistake, but they never admit they made a mistake. <laughs> That's the Chinese government. They were very familiar that. In China we say, uh, <laughs> so uh, they're always say, uh, do the right thing in the right time, uh, they, they all say that, but actually they know they made mistakes. Uh, second category is uh, from the media. They want to team, listen to the concept and stories. Uh, they, they mainly focus on the concept of stories. The third one is uh, the analyst, it's audience. They use model, they, they, they mark to the model rather than mark to the market. Uh, <laughs> In, in, in the normal cases, it's okay. But when we got some crisis, it failed. Uh, 
The, third, the last one is the economist from the university, like the, those uh, professors. <laughs> they have logic. They have methodologies. What I, be careful. What they are talking is uh, the things ought to be rather than going to be. <laughs> Just time for one last question. Angela Chen, and my question is, you're talking about reform. What is your reform different from uh, Liu Xiaobo? Because you're my friend, I don't want you to go to I, jail I'm, for I'm 11 years. Within the, I, I'm within the system. Huh? I'm within the system. I'm part of the uh, Communist Party system. Oh. <laughs> I try to reform from the system rather than in, in the opposite way. Oh, so you have a privilege. <laughs> Chairman, thank you so much, Chairman Chen, for a very, very interesting presentation. We will, we will have about a 15-minute break, um, and if any of you are leaving, please leave your badges um, so we can recycle them in baskets that will be outside. But we'll reconvene at 10:15. Uh,